Orthodox Survival Course by Father Seraphim Rose and Father Pod Mashinsky. Lecture 11, Evolution. Now we come to this key concept, which is extremely important for understanding the religious outlook of contemporary man. The whole outlook, both religious and secular. This idea is an extremely complex one, and here we can give only a sketchy outline of the problems involved in this question. Since the time of Darwin and his Origin of the Species, which came out in 1859 and was instantly accepted by many people, and soon became very popular, especially with people such as T.H. Huxley, Herbert Spencer in Germany, there was Ernst Haeckel, 1834 through 1919, who wrote The Riddle of the Universe, and others who popularized the ideas of Darwin and made evolution the very center of their whole philosophy. It seems to explain everything. Of course, people like Nietzsche picked it up and used it for his so-called spiritual prophecies so that the people who are in the main school of Western thought, this rationalism carried as far as you can take it, accepted evolution. And to the present day, one can say that it is a central dogma of advanced thinkers, of people who are in harmony with the times. But from the very beginning, there were people who were arguing about this. There was a Catholic thinker, who believed in evolution but not in natural selection, which reduced Darwin to despair because the latter discovered that his idea cannot be proved. But especially in the last 10 to 30 years, there have come out many critical accounts of evolution from the more objective point of view. Most of the books supporting evolution begin already with a certain premise which they assume the naturalistic outlook, and so forth. But now there is even a whole society in San Diego called the Scientific Creationism Institute, which has come out with several good books. They themselves are religious, but they have several books which discuss evolution quite objectively, not at all from any religious standpoint. They say there are two models for understanding the universe. One is the evolution model, and one is the creation model. They take the evidence, the history of the earth, the geological layers, and so forth, and they try to see which models these fit. And they have discovered that fewer adjustments have to be made if one follows the model of creation. If there was a god who created things in the beginning, and if the earth is not billions of years old, but only some thousands of years old. The evolutionary model, on the other hand, requires a good many corrections, which can be compared to the old Ptolemaic universe versus Copernican, and which is proving quite cumbersome. In fact, some members of this institute travel around to various universities, and in the last year or two, They have held several debates before thousands of spectators at the University of Tennessee, Texas, and so forth. Interest has been quite high, and those defending evolution have not been able to give sound evidence in support of it, and, in fact, on several points were caught on their ignorance of several recent discoveries in paleontology. There are then people who are very sophisticated and knowledgeable defending both points of view. Here we won't even discuss the question of atheistic evolution, because it is obviously a philosophy of fools and people who can believe, as Huxley said, that if you put a group of monkeys with typewriters, they will eventually give you the Encyclopedia Britannica, given enough time, if not millions then billions of years, according to the laws of chance. Someone calculated this according to the laws of chance, and found that, in fact, such a thing would never happen. But anyone who can believe that can believe anything. The more serious dispute is between theistic evolution, 
that God created the world and then it evolved, and then the Christian point of view. Here we must say that the fundamentalist point of view is incorrect in many instances because they don't know how to interpret scripture. They say, for example, that the book of Genesis must be understood literally, and one cannot do this. The Holy Fathers tell us which parts are literal and which parts are not. The first misunderstanding which must be cleared away, even before discussing this question, is one that causes many people to miss the point, and that is that we must distinguish between evolution and variation. Variation is the process by which the people who make various hybrids of peas, different kinds of cats, after 50 years of experimentation they come up with a new kind of cat, which is a combination of Siamese and Persian, called the Himalayan cat, which has long hair like a Persian with the coloring of a Siamese. This had happened accidentally, but it was never able to reproduce itself purely and only now after all these years of experimentation have they come up with a new breed which breeds true. Just so there are different species of dogs, different kinds of plants, and the very races of men are all quite different. Pygmies, Hottentots, Chinese, Northern Europeans, all different kinds of human beings who came from one ancestor. And so the question of variation is one thing. There are undoubtedly many variations within one type or kind of creature, and these variations can be erected by people on scientific principle. But these variations never produce anything new. They only produce a different kind of dog or cat or bean or people. In fact, the different species, and this term is itself quite arbitrary, for the most part are not able to bear offspring, and in the few cases where they can, and the mule is produced, it is not able itself to reproduce itself. And St. Ambrose of Milan says, This is an example to you, O man, to stop meddling in the ways of God. God means for each creature to be separate. During the period of the Enlightenment, the view of nature, also called the Enlightenment worldview, was quite stable. In fact, just before this time, the Anglican Archbishop, Usher, calculated all the years given in the Old Testament and came up with the idea that the world was created in the year 4004 BC. Newton believed this, and the enlightened worldview was in favor of the idea that God in six days created the world and then left it to develop itself and all the species were just as we see them today, and the scientists of that time accepted that. At the end of the period of the Enlightenment, however, as the revolutionary fever began to come on, this very stable worldview began to break down, and already some scientists were coming up with more radical theories. At the end of the 18th century, already Erasmus Darwin, the grandfather of Charles Darwin, came up with the hypothesis that all of life comes from one primordial filament, which is exactly what is meant today by the theory of evolution. It is not a theory concerning only one species or kind of creature, but the theory that everything comes from some primordial blob or filament, and that this developed into the different kinds of creatures by transmutations. This new kind of explanation, which he came up with then, is an attempt to continue the spirit of the Enlightenment as utter rationalism and simplicity. As the rationalism entered deeper into the mind, it was simpler to believe, he thought, to explain life as coming from one single living filament, instead of the more complicated explanation that God gave being all at once to all different kinds of creatures. There was one naturalist, Lamarck, who had a definite evolutionary theory just after this, but he had the idea that the changes necessary to account for the evolving of one species into another 
were due to the inheritance of acquired characteristics, and this could never be proved and has in fact been quite disproved, and so the idea of evolution did not take hold. But there was one important geologist at this period of the early 19th century who gave a great impetus towards this acceptance of the idea of evolution, and this was Charles Lyell, who came up with the theory of uniformitarianism, that is, that all the changes we see in the earth today are not due to some kind of catastrophes, a sudden flood, or something similar, but that the processes we see today have been operating in past centuries, past ages, from the beginning of the world, as far as we can see. And therefore, if we look at the Grand Canyon, we see that the river has been eating away the canyon, and you can calculate by taking into account how fast the water flows, how much water there is in it now, the quality of the soil, and so on, how long it must have taken to wear away all that. And Lyell thinks that if we assume that these processes were going on at the same rate, this being very rational and given to calculation, we come up with a uniform explanation of things. And of course, there is no proof of this. This is merely his hypothesis. But this, together with the idea which was now gaining sympathy, that species evolve into the other, if you put these two together, you get the idea that most likely the world is not just a few thousand years old, like the Christians seem to say, but it must be very many thousands or even millions of years old, or even more. This begins the greater and greater age of the earth. But again, this was only a presupposition a belief that the earth must be very old. It was not proved. But already this idea was sinking into the minds of men, and when Darwin came up in 1859 with his book with the idea of natural selection, as opposed to Lamarck, who said that the giraffe was evolved because a short-necked creature stretched his neck to eat the higher leaves, and his ancestors had a neck an inch longer, the next one stretched a little more, and gradually it became what we know today as a giraffe. This is against all scientific laws because such things don't happen. An acquired characteristic cannot be inherited as, for example, when the Chinese women had their feet bound, their daughters were always born with normal feet. But Darwin came up with the idea that there were perhaps two longer-necked creatures who survived, because they had longer necks, and they were joined together because all the rest died off, because of some kind of disaster, and their children did have longer necks because they were. A change had occurred within them, a mutation. This might have been a chance thing at first, but once reproduction between two such like creatures has taken place, it continues down throughout the ages. Of course, this is a guess, because no one has observed such a thing to happen. But this kind of a guess struck upon the consciousness of the people. They were like tinder, all ready for it, and this was the spark. The idea sounded so plausible, and the idea of evolution took hold, not because it was proved. As a matter of fact, the speculations of Darwin were based almost entirely upon his observations, not of evolution, but of variation. Because he wondered, when he was traveling in the Galapagos Islands, why there were 13 different varieties of one type of finch, and thought it was because there was one original variety which had developed according to its environment. This is not evolution, but variation. From this, he jumped to the conclusion that if you keep making small changes like that, eventually you will have a different species. The problem is trying to prove this scientifically is that no one has ever observed these larger changes. They have only observed changes within a type, within a species. Let us look then at the so-called proofs of evolution 
to see what kind they are. We are not going to try to disprove, but just to try to see the quality of the proof they use. What is it that seems convincing to people who believe in evolution? There is a standard textbook of zoology used 20 years ago, and it lists a number of proofs. The first of these is called comparative morphology. That is, man has arms, birds have wings, the fish have flippers. They even have convincing diagrams which make them look very much alike, even the moth. The birds have claws and we have fingers, and they show how one might have developed into the other. Father S. is showing illustrations from page 215 of General Zoology by Storer. All creatures are shown to have a very similar structure, and the different structures are all in different phyla and gena, families, and so on. Of course, this is not a proof. This is very logical to one who already believes in evolution. But, as the scientific creationists say, if you believe that God created, his basic master plan of creation, that is, that all kinds of creatures have a basic similarity in their plan. If you believe that God created them, these pictures convince you that, yes, God created them in a sort of gradation. If you believe that one evolved into the other, you look at the same picture and say, yes, one evolved into the other. But there is no proof either for or against evolution in this. In fact, People accept evolution on some other basis, and then look at this, and this convinces them even more. Secondly, there is comparative physiology. The tissue and fluids of organisms show many basic similarities in physiological and chemical properties that, for example, from the hemoglobin in vertebrate blood, a certain kind of oxyhemoglobin crystals can be obtained. Their crystalline structure parallels that of vertebrate classification, which is based on body structure. Those of these species are distinct, but all from a, the one, genus, have some common characteristic. Furthermore, those of all birds have certain resemblances, but differ from crystals obtained from the blood of mammals or reptiles. This is the same thing as in morphology. If you believe in creation, you say that God made similar creatures with similar blood, and there is no problem. If you believe in evolution, you say that one evolved into the other. In fact, in one of the dating systems that has been devised from precipitations from blood, they see that they are similar in each species, something in common, with those in one genus, and quite distinct in birds, monkeys, and so forth. And from this they make certain calculations, and decide how many years apart on the evolutionary scale these different creatures are. As it happens, their calculations throw everything else off. If this is to be accepted, other dating systems have to be changed. And so it is still controversial and actually proves nothing because you can accept it either as proof of evolution or of God's creation. There is a third argument called comparative embryology. Textbooks like this, General Zoology, used to have these classical pictures which, baby fish, salamander, turtle, chicken, pig, man. They all look very much alike, and they gradually evolve differently. Besides, you see that man has so-called gill slits in the embryo. Therefore, this is a remembrance of his ancestry. Ernst Haeckel and the theory of recapitulation and biogenetic law. An individual organism in its development, ontology, tends to recapitulate the stages passed through by its ancestors, phylogeny. Today this theory is no longer accepted by evolutionists, that the gill slits are not gill slits at all,
but they are just preparing for what is to be developed in the neck of the human being. So this proof has been pretty well discarded. Again, they use the argument that similarity means proof, which in fact does not. Another proof which used to be more powerful than it is today is that of vestigial organs. There are certain things like the appendix in man which seem to have no function now and therefore must be left over from a previous stage of evolution, when he was a monkey, or sometime when he used this organ. But more and more, these vestigial organs are found to have certain use. The appendix is found to have some kind of glandular function, so this argument is also losing its weight. And just because we don't know what a certain organ does, this does not mean that it is left over from some lower form of life. Then there are arguments from paleontology, the study of fossils. Of course, the very first very convincing thing is the geological strata, as for example, the Grand Canyon where you can see all kinds of strata. And the lower you get, the more primitive the creatures seem to be and they date the strata by what kind of creatures are found in them. Father Seraphim is showing illustration from General Zoology page 222 of strata in the Grand Canyon. There is a whole story how in the 19th century they discovered these strata and how they determined which were older and which were younger, and now they think they have a pretty elaborate system to tell which strata are older and which are younger. But the whole dating system is rather circular, because they date, since often these strata are upside down, they have to have certain readjustments, just like the Ptolemaic system needed certain adjustments to make epicycles, because the planets were not going around the Earth uniformly. In the same way, you must make adjustments when you find the strata are upside down. You have to date them by the fossils in them. But how do you know that the fossils in them are in the right order? You know because somewhere else the fossils were in the right way, and you got the system from that. But as you look at it, it is a kind of circular system, and you have to have faith that this actually corresponds to reality there are a number of flaws in this. For one thing, the new creatures come quite suddenly into each strata with no intermediary types. Besides this, as research continues, they are finding animals in the strata which are not supposed to be there, so that now in the pre-Cambrian level, they are finding quite advanced squid and all kinds of animals like that which should not be there because they weren't evolved until some hundred million years later. And you either have to change your idea of the squid's evolution, or say this was an exception. But in general there is no proof that these strata were laid down over millions of years. And the creationists who talk about the flood of Noah say that it is equally conceivable that the flood of Noah caused exactly the same thing, because the more advanced animals would be going on higher ground, trying to get away from the flood. The lower marine animals would obviously be the first to be buried, and there would be little, few, remnants of man at all, because man would be trying to get on ships and other things to get away. And there are only very particular conditions which cause a fossil to be left at all. It has to be buried suddenly in a certain kind of mud which allows it to be preserved. The whole idea of the gradualness of these phenomena is being called more and more into question. In fact, there is now proof that oil and coal and such things can be made in an extremely short time in a matter of days or weeks. The formation of fossils itself is very much in favor of some catastrophe. The final thing which is against evolution is that it is hard to say that there has ever been found a single thing which can be called an intermediary species. In fact, 
Darwin was extremely worried about this. He said, According to my theory, there should be a million intermediary species at least or more, and I have never found one. But we will wait until the fossil record is more complete. And today's scientists say that the fossil record is extremely complete, and there are more fossil species known than living species. And still there have not been found more than a couple which might be interpreted as somehow being an intermediary species. They will tell you about the pterodactyl, this reptile with wings, and say this reptile is becoming a bird. But why can't you simply say this is a reptile with wings? And there are certain fossils called index fossils, which, when seen in a certain strata, mean the strata cannot be any older or younger than a certain date, because that animal was extinct at that period. And they found one recently that was supposed to be extinct 500 million years ago, which is swimming around in the ocean. And because it was thought to be an index fossil, it threw off the whole thing. And that particular layer which was dated, according to this extinct fish, is no longer correct. And why is it that certain species evolve and others stay the same as they were? There are many species found in the past which are exactly the same as currently living species. And they have ideas that some are reprobate species that don't go anywhere for some reason, and others are more progressive species because they have the energy to go forward. But that is faith, not proof. And so, the fossil species which have been preserved are just as distinct from each other as living species. Then we have something else which you find in all textbooks of evolution, the horse and the elephant. General Zoology, pages 226 through 228, illustrations. And there is a great deal of subjectivity involved, just as when you make the Neanderthal man look bent over to resemble an ape. This is imagination, not scientific proof, but something based on one's philosophical ideas. And there is quite a bit of such evidence which is either pretty much against evolution or shows there is no proof one way or the other. And there are some things which are quite remarkable and are unable to be explained by evolution. Just recently in the last two to three years, they discovered a place in Texas where there are dinosaur tracks and right next to it, human tracks. And in one place, the human tracks and the dinosaur tracks overlap which shows that these two creatures were living at the same time. The Protestants made a movie about this and show it as a proof against evolution. But one of the scientists who saw this, he was a creationist, said, Well, this is very interesting, isn't it? And one man who believed in evolution looked at it and said, I don't believe it. He has faith that this didn't happen, that this dinosaur was extinct before man came and therefore it is impossible to have dinosaur and human tracks together, or else you make an epicycle in your system to provide some kind of explanation. The final so-called proof of evolution is mutation. In fact, the serious scientist will tell you that all the rest is not really proof, but the one proof is mutations. And, in fact, Randall, who wrote this History of Modern Thought, he himself is an evolutionist, says, At present, biologists admit that we do not, strictly speaking, know anything about the causes of the origins of new species. We must fall back upon the scientific faith that they occur because of chemical changes in the germ plasm. He then is sophisticated enough to admit that this is a faith. There are some like Dobzhansky who say that, I have proved evolution because I have made a new species in the laboratory. And so, after 30 years of working on fruit flies who multiply very quickly, 
you can get a whole equivalent of several hundred thousand years of human life in a few decades. He experimented by radiating fruit flies and finally came up with two who had changes. They had no wings or something. And they were no longer able to interbreed with the other kind of fruit fly. And this is his definition of species, that they can't interbreed. And therefore, I have evolved a new species. Well, in the first case, this was done under extremely artificial conditions with radiation. And you have to have a new theory of radioactive waves from outer space in order to justify it. And secondly, it is still a fruit fly. So it has no wings or it's purple instead of yellow. It is still a fruit fly and is basically no different from any other fruit fly. It's simply another variety. So he has actually proved nothing. Besides that, mutations are 99% harmful, and all experiments, including those by scientists who have worked on this for many decades, all have proved unsuccessful to show any kind of real change from one creature into another, even the most primitive kind that reproduces itself every 10 days. If anything, the evidence in that sphere is for the stability of species. But in the end, we have to say that there is no conclusive proof, scientific proof, for evolution. And likewise, there is not any conclusive proof against evolution. Because even though it might not seem too logical or too plausible according to the evidence, still there is no proof that given a billion or trillion years, you might not produce from an amoeba a man or a monkey. A man who is more complicated because he has a soul. Who knows? If you have a completely objective mind and don't consider for a moment what the Holy Fathers say, you might think that perhaps it's true, especially if there is a God. By chance, you have no argument at all. The latter, if one were to believe in chance, requires much more faith than to believe in God. In any case, the evidence we have just examined makes sense to you according to what your philosophy is. And the creationist philosophy requires less adjustment of the evidence. And so it is more in accordance with simplistic and uniformitarian presuppositions of modern science. There is one more thing which has been used as a kind of proof of evolution, and that is the dating system. Radiocarbon, potassium argon, uranium decay, fluorine system, and so on. These were all discovered in the present century, some of them just recently. They say that this proves the world is really very old, and in one textbook it says this is a revolution in dating because before that, we only had relative ideas of age, and now we have absolute ideas. You can test your potassium argon and come up with the idea that a certain rock is 3 billion, 2 billion years old. They allow a margin of error of about 10%. The fact of the matter is that the great age of the Earth was already known supposedly by scientists before these dating systems were developed, and the dating systems already accepted, or based on, the presuppositions which led to the idea that the world was already many millions, if not billions, of years old. So they are not really revolutionary in dating, they simply fit into an already accepted view. If these new dating systems had said that the world was only 5,000 years old instead of 3 billion, scientists would not have been accepting them so easily. Secondly, there are certain basic principles, presuppositions, which these dating systems must have. The carbon-14 system, which traces the radioactive decay of half-life of carbon-14 to carbon-12, requires 1 that there is absolute uniformity, 
that the decay rate has always been the same for as long as the process has been going on. Two, that there has been no contamination from outside sources, which they admit does happen. And three, that the thing being dated has been isolated, buried somewhere, and nothing else has been touching it from outside, no organic matter. And finally, four, that there was no carbon-12 in the first place, it was all carbon-14. All these things are assumptions, they are not proved. Many people, even among non-evolutionists, will admit that carbon-14 is the most reliable of all the dating systems. Even the scientific creationists admit that it has an accuracy back perhaps 2,000 years. It has been tested on certain articles whose age has been determined, and it proved to be not far off in most cases. But beyond 2,000 or 3,000 years, it becomes extremely dubious. And even those adherents to this system admit that because the half-life of carbon is 5,600 years or so, it cannot be accurate beyond 20,000 or 30,000 years at most. The other systems, potassium, argon, uranium, and so forth, claim to have a half-life of 1 billion, 300 million years. And therefore, when they talk about improving the age of old rocks, they use these systems. The carbon-14 system is used only on organic matter, only on the fossils themselves, and potassium argon and uranium systems on rocks. But the same things are true. There must be uniformity throughout the billion years, no contamination from outside. We must assume that it was all potassium in the beginning before it decayed to argon. And all these things you have to take on faith. And if you try to measure anything recent, say only a million years ago, and you take this system with a half-life of a billion years, it is like trying to measure a millimeter with a yardstick, and it is not very accurate even assuming it is valid. And there have been numerous cases when they have applied this system to new rocks, and they give them a life of two billion years old. Therefore, the whole thing is very shaky, and it requires that those billion years exist in the first place. There are other kinds of tests which have been used at various times, as for example, the rate at which sodium is dissolved into the oceans, the rate at which various chemicals are discharged into the ocean. You measure the amount of the elements there are now in the oceans, measure approximately how much it goes into the sea each year, and from that you come up with a guess of how old the ocean must be and probably the ocean is as old as the world. They did this with sodium and discovered the world was, say, a billion years old. But it was found that you get different answers depending on which element you use, ranging from lead, which gives a life rating of 150 years, others give 5,000 years, some 500, some 10 billion. There is absolutely no uniformity. There are other tests. For example, one tried the rate at which nickel accumulates on the earth in meteorites. By taking approximately the amount of nickel which accumulates in the earth from the meteorites every year and projecting it into the past on the uniformitarian basis, and one person made a calculation that if the earth was 5 billion years old, according to the latest guess, there is another test, the rate of helium, which also gives some utterly fantastical result. Therefore, these tests are very unsure, and some of them make it very dubious that the world could be anything like that, 50 billion years old. When you come down to it, it depends what your faith is. Some scientists think the Earth is very old because so far evolution is unthinkable unless the Earth is very old. 
And if you believe in evolution, you must believe the Earth is very old, since evolution does not work on any kind of short scale. But as far as any scientific proof, there is none whatsoever that the Earth is 5 billion years old or 7,000 years old. It could be either. It depends on what kind of suppositions you start with. So evolution is not, in fact, a scientific problem. It is a philosophical question. And we have to realize that the theory of evolution is acceptable to certain scientists, certain people, philosophers, because they have been accepting something like the presuppositions that they have prepared for it. Here is another quote or two from this same Randall, who believed in evolution, talking about how much faith enters into this. As we already read, at present, biologists admit that we do not, strictly speaking, know the causes of the origin of new species. We must fall back on the faith that they occur because of chemical changes in the germ plasm. That is the scientific faith. And if you question the scientist, he will say, but anything else is unthinkable. The anything else meaning that God created the world 7,000 or 8,000 years ago. Again, he says, describing the effect of evolution on the world, In spite of these difficulties, the beliefs of men today have become thoroughly permeated with the concept of evolution. The great underlying notions and concepts that meant so much to the 18th century, nature and reason and utility, have largely given way to a new set better expressing the ultimate intellectual ideas of the growing world. Many social factors conspired to popularize the idea of development and its corollaries. Evolution has introduced a whole new scale of values, where for the 18th century the ideal was the rational, the natural, even the primitive and unspoiled. For us, the desirable is identified rather with the latter end of the process of development, and our terms of praise are modern, up-to-date, advanced, progressive. Just as much as the Enlightenment, we tend to identify what we approved with nature. But for us, it is not the rational order of nature, but the culmination of an evolutionary process which we take for our leverage in existence. The 18th century could think of nothing worse than to call a man than a unnatural enthusiast. We prefer to dub him an antiquated and outgrown fossil. That age believed a theory if it were called rational, useful, and natural. We favor it if it is the most recent development. We had rather be modernists and progressives than sound reasoners. It is perhaps an open question if in our new scale of values we have not lost as much as we have gained. The idea of evolution, as it has finally come to be understood, has reinforced the humanistic and naturalistic attitude. This concludes the reading of the Introduction to Lecture 11 on Evolution of the Orthodox Survival Course by Father Seraphim Rose and Father Pod Mashinsky. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe, and click the notification bell for notifications for any new posts. And I left a link to my Patreon in the description. Thank you, and God bless. Thank you.